Alumni Hall, where you'll find officially licensed FSU gear for the entire family, including brands like Nike and Champion, plus great gifts for your favorite Seminole and home decor, too. Miss some of the old Seminole throwback logos? Check out our College Vault collection. Shop online at alumnihall.com and let our great customer sales team ship to you within days. Or pick up in-store in Tallahassee. You'll find us in the Miracle Plaza Shopping Center on Thomasville Road. Students and military get 10% off in-store. And Osceola subscribers get 20% off in-store and online with their digital membership cards. Alumni Hall. It's the Osceola Seminole Sidelines. For more on the Seminoles, including Osceola's coverage from veteran Seminole insiders, message boards, Osceola virtual happy hours, and more, go to theosceola.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Osceola's Seminole Sidelines podcast, presented by Alumni Hall, your source for officially licensed FSU gear for the entire family. Please visit Alumni Hall at alumnihall.com or at their Tallahassee store located at 1817 Thomasville Road. My name is Pat Burnham, a host of Seminole Sidelines, and joining me today to discuss FSU's win over Boston College on Saturday are Osceola publisher Jerry Cutts, Osceola managing editor Bob Ferrante, Osceola recruiting analyst Charles Fishbine, and Osceola football analyst and former FSU offensive lineman Mark Salva. But before we get started today, I want to remind our Osceola subscribers to log on to the Osceola and click on the Alumni Hall ad to sign up for your 20% discount code to apply to your online purchases this holiday season. All right, guys, FSU uh, is hot. They won their second game in a row on Saturday with a 26-23 win over Boston College in Chestnut Hill. It was a game that was definitively a tale of two halves. FSU raced out to a uh, huge halftime lead, 19-3. Uh, to uh, Looked like they were going to dominate the game, came out and scored an early touchdown with about 12 and a half minutes to go in the third quarter to take a 26-3 lead. We're dominating on both sides of the ball in the first half. Boston College made a furious comeback to have the ball down 26-23 in FSU's uh, half of the field through an interception to end the game, uh, sealed the deal for Florida State. Uh, This team is always playing interesting games. Jerry, you were there. Kind of give us your take on the victory that got FSU to win one game of being bowl eligible after starting 0-4. It was a beautiful day up there. It's crystal clear. I mean, that's a beautiful campus. And, uh, um, you know, like you said, Florida State raced out to a big lead. One factor that they won't, you know, uh, see, I don't think, in Gainesville is that crowd at Boston College was very sparse. The uh, stadium was probably half full. And uh, so there wasn't, like, a lot of crowd noise or it wasn't a uh, – it was a road win, which is always, always good. But it wasn't a real uh, intimidating crowd like uh, Clemson had been. But the, I thought the key thing was this was a game where Florida State did not bring its A game in the second half, and they still managed to win it. And uh, that, I think, is a step in the right direction. Uh, you're not always going to play good, but can you hang in there and win? And that, that was something that they did this year that we haven't seen a Florida State team do in, in years. Now, obviously, as we said, they did get off the bus ready to play and that took the big lead. Do you guys think that maybe that is the second half letdown is more indicative of still a relatively young football team that maybe thought they had it uh, in the bag? Or is this couldn't play eight quarters of uh, intense focus football coming off on a huge game against Miami a week, a week ago? Yeah, so my take on it was this. I- we came out I, – I thought our preparation going into the game was outstanding. I thought our game plans – I thought the game plan on offense and defense was outstanding. I loved when we came out and we were in different personnel groups. We would line up one way, we'd shift, and then we'd motion and, you know, a lot of that. And, and we had Boston College spinning like a top, you know. And on top of that, we executed really, really well on both sides of the ball. It looks like we had them – Dial, we had the defense dialed in to, to what they were doing. And the way, we, you know, the, the two ends, the defensive line just dominated the pass rush, really shook up the quarterback, got him kind of shook up. So, yeah, we came out and really fast start. And with a young football team, our concentration 
lagged, right? So that the, that middle part of the game where we seem to kind of kind of just lose concentration, and then the penalties started happening, and then you know just off here, a few drops here, and maybe a miss block there or a miss tackle here, and you know it just it just we just kind of lost our concentration there, at, you know, about the third quarter until the end when things started getting real tight. And then we had to obviously, you know, make a stop and, and, and do some things. So I think that's just indicative of a young football team. And again, every experience is a new experience. I don't, I can't recall the last time we went and got ahead in a game like this um, really fast playing that well, you know, so that's a new experience. How do you handle success? That's, that's, a, that's another new experience for this group of players. And to Jerry's point, that, that Boston College atmosphere is really different. They don't even have a band. I think they have a pop band. I was there two years ago. They have no, like that. Don't they? They have like they, it's like they went down to the corner bar and had a yeah. No, what they had, what they I counted the pieces in the band. There were about 150 in the marching band, um, and but they do. To your point, uh, they had a uh, they they had a DJ spinning uh, spinning records in the yeah. But don't, don't they have like a drummer and a bass player and a guitar? You know, don't they have that? I thought it sounds like Columbus High School. That's what they. Yeah, I didn't, yeah it was weird. It's just a weird. I didn't vibe, see the know? band. I didn't okay. see the band this year. Now they, they, need get, they need to get Aerosmith. That's who they need to get. They well, it's just, just it's just a different Aero. vibe. You know, it's, it's that whole – it's it's Northeast, I guess. I don't know. It's just a different vibe. It's, it's kind of like at Rutgers where they have a DJ that sits in one of the end zones yeah. playing music. It is different up there. It's certainly not the same. So, I think, I think you put all that together, and I think you get – you got what you got, you know. But, look, you don't like to make excuses with officiating and stuff like that, but so, – well, yeah. I'm glad you said that because I don't like talking about officiating most of the time, but I do want to talk about it now because I went back through the damn play. <laughs> and there were like seven calls that never should have been made, including Jamie Robinson's targeting, which was not targeting. I think if he I think if he had simply if his face mask had been facing forward instead of his head down, I think he's still in the game. But that was a ridiculous call. We are playing football. So the Paul, OPI, the OPI on, on Jordan Wilson. That was, was crazy. Was, that was nuts. The you know? personal foul on the punt return, crazy. The, uh, and I'm not, in the backfield. I mean, come on. I am not a guy that goes with conspiracy theories when it comes to officiating, but I, ha- I I am in the NFL, not so much in college football. Well, not really at all in college football, but there was something amiss on Saturday in Boston College. Boston College had a 12th man. Anybody want to talk about it? <laughs> I think you covered it pretty well. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I think the ACC uh, office you know, is going to I- do nothing about it, too. Let's, let's emphasize this has happened for years. It's going to continue to happen for years. Right. Until you have a philosophical shift among coaches and ADs of how you want to handle officiating at the highest level. And it's really not the league office. It's more of schools, administrators, and coaches. They have to address it in the offseason. Wasn't there the horrible call with Dalvin against Clemson? It's not like this is not new to Florida State is the referees being against them. I mean, it's, I don't think there's some conspiracy. I just think that, these refs just automatically just go out there and throw a lot of flags with them on the field for whatever. Well, when you when, when you got all these bang bang plays, sure. you know, and, and, and the refs aren't very good, you're going to get mistakes. And I think that happens. As far as the targeting thing goes, you know, I think it should be like the NBA. Like you have a like a, a technical one and a technical two. You know, something where. You know, if it if it's just a bang bang play like like Jamie Robinson's was, if there's no you know intent, what? if there's no intent, yeah. it just happened because it's a football play. If it's total disregard, yeah, if it's total disregard for the rule, and you just try to blow somebody up as yeah. defenseless, then then yeah, throw them out of the game. But if it's just the bang bang play, the guy's running, you know, in that situation that we had, okay, fifteen yards, you know, but don't throw them out of the game. Yeah, and and even the Dan, yeah, I agree with you. Listen, I think they need to go to the hockey type rule for that particular foul and you get put in the penalty box for three minutes the next time your side of the ball is on the field, something like that, a certain number of plays, but it's certainly too punitive. But I mean, even outside of that call, the illegal formation on Darius Washington, I've never, I've never yeah. seen it where a team did not get a warning that, Hey, bud, you need to scoot up or I'm going to call it on you next time. That happens, that happens all the time. So, Hey man, you got to scoot up. You know, the refs talk to the players on that stuff. You know, well, and my point is, and the reason I talk about all that is because, listen, one of the reasons that Boston College was able to make part of that comeback is because of those seven second half penalties, some of which were bad calls. Right. So, how much, you know, we, there I put in there, my there, first impressions that 
you know, maybe there was a little lack of focus, but when you go back and look at the penalties that were called, I'm not sure you could say Florida State was lack focus in that game. Maybe intensity in the second half, but I don't know if you could say they lack focus. They, were, they weren't consistent, though. There was a one – there was a one play where the quarterback slid, and I don't, I, I don't know if that was a targeting play, but the guy it was. slid. They called the 15-yard penalty. The same play happened in the fourth quarter, I think, on the last drive, and they didn't call it. So I, I don't. There, that's the problem you'll have is where there's a lack of consistency from one. Yeah. One. I think the bottom line is those refs. They're just not very good refs. Yeah. Well. One of the reasons Florida State did not could uh, absorb the twelfth man uh, and, and the second half comeback was because of what the defense did very early in the game. Uh, now the first time I could, I mean, they literally dominated. Of course, I think Keir Thomas and uh, Jermaine Johnson made themselves a lot of money, or more money than they were going to get previous to that game because they both had standout games. Now, Mark, you and I are not very impressed with Boston College's offensive line, despite the fact that they do have a tremendously experienced offensive line, but they're not as athletically gifted as maybe some that we face this year. But um, that, yeah. didn't look, that did not look like a typical boss at college no. offensive line. I was surprised. They look kind of small and sloppy. But, but just your thoughts, Bob, I'll get your thoughts on the front four's performance throughout the game. And ironically enough, it was a pressure by Jermaine Johnson, which forced the final th- uh, interception or the only interception thrown by Drogovic that – basically into the game. Just your thoughts on those front four, those guys up on the front four? I think just about everything that Florida State did well, you know, especially at the, the second level and the secondary was a byproduct of what happened with the front four. The front four consistently being able to apply pressure. For example, Jermaine Johnson rushing Jerkovich on the safety. What well, was a great read by Deloach, and he knew it was going to be a screen or at least saw it develop. But it was because Jermaine Johnson got so intensely in there, Kalen Deloach was able to make a great play. And it's just all these little plays add up for other guys around the field to, to be making plays. Um, I think Keir Thomas in the last month has, has really taken a huge jump forward. I mean, we always knew he was going to be a leader. We thought he was going to be productive. But it did feel like there was a gap between Johnson and Thomas as far as just what they were giving you week to week on the field. Mm-hmm. And, and now it's almost like, wow, you know, this, this is truly a, a bookend deal. Um, don't want to compare them to the guys back in the 90s. That, that's pretty unfair. But these guys are playing at such a high level that, I mean, they're, they're first team all ACC defensive ends. They're, they're, playing, they're playing really hard. That's funny you said that, Bob, because my thought was that reminded me of Danny Warfel. One of the kids, uh, Pete Bowyer and Hard Wilson, when he was just getting hammered up in Boak that one game, I was like, "Man, this guy's get this guy's not gonna make it through the game. This keeps up, you know." Yeah, yeah. He, I'm not sure he was total he- totally healthy coming into the game based on some of his throws. But listen, uh, whatever they did, I don't know how this happened, but the official scorekeeper only gave FSU credit for seven quarterback hurries. I've got a series written down in my notes where they had four in one series. Uh, that number had to be a hell of a lot closer to 15 than it did seven and maybe even been to 20. But uh, what the end result of that was, was Jerkovic going 10 of 24, completing 41% of his passes. He had been completing 63 coming into the game. And that was one of our keys uh, for FSU to win this ball game. And uh, we hit it, Fish. I believe that was uh, that was one of your keys. So you hit that nail on the head. Which one was uh, that? The uh, fill fill the pressure get the get pressure on Drukovic and yeah you know they had uh, the four sacks obviously and uh, then this I had a lot more than seven quarterback pressures but whatever they did worked uh, 148 yards the pass offense I really thought that was the way they might be able to challenge Florida State uh, in this game and uh, obviously uh, that was probably the key to success uh, on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, again, Bob, this is yours, and it should they need? Like I said in the article, they need to. If FSU's offense had a motto or theme T-shirt that Coach Bob used to do, it would be "Run the Daggum Ball," and it sets up everything for Florida State's offense. And it'll be a key against Florida. We'll get to that later. It has been a key, just like it has been throughout the season. Uh, and uh, they started off with 70, 71 first half yards, rushing the ball. Uh, obviously, in addition to that, defenses have to account for uh, Jordan Travis, whether it's a run down or pass down. Uh, he had a tremendous game, uh, 20 of 34 for 251. 
He certainly seems to be coming to his more comfortable as a drop back passer and more in his own and Mike Norvell's offense. Uh, Bob just kind of talked to the offensive performance on Saturday. And we felt like going back to, to August, the identity was going to be to run the ball. And we just weren't sure who the quarterback was going to be. But as it evolved, you saw what Jordan Travis could do and, and kind of Mackenzie Milton's shortcomings just as far as how the, the offense really, really flowed and, and how it functioned with the offensive line. Um, I, I think Jordan Travis, just, just the elusiveness, but, but also the efficiency in the passing game. We're, we're seeing a quarterback that um, the coaches are just completely in love with, uh, in love with the relationship Kenny Dillingham talking on Monday about just how close Mike Norvell and Jordan Travis have, have become, how important that quarterback and head coach relationship is the trust and, and it, it shows up on the practice field. It really shows up to everybody on Saturdays, just what, what that bond, what that relationship can, can do for you. But I do think in the end, you have to run the ball. You have to run the ball for this team to be successful, to, um, you know, really to, to keep a, a team like BC on the sideline as much as possible. I don't think the numbers were great in the end. I mean, it was only 3.7 yards per carry and, and you lose you lose some here and there on the sack yardage, but it, it felt like it just functions well again with Travis at quarterback and you're able to run the ball. Yeah, and to your point, uh the, the, the numbers in the second half of Florida State rushing the ball were not as near as good as they were in the first half. And of course that just happens to coincide with Boston College being able to make a little bit of a run there. So you're exactly right. But uh listen uh you know, I think one of the other things I took out of this game, uh, I don't know how, if you guys did or not, but we're starting to see the emergence of some young receivers. Ja'Kai Douglas, four catches for 44 yards. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you know, we've been waiting for a great catch. <laughs> you know, we, we, we see the easy drops, but we don't see the great catches. And then uh, another true uh, – well, true freshman Malik McLean goes up in the corner of the end zone, makes a great grab. Uh, Bob and Jerry, I know that when we were going to practice in two a day, you guys obviously pay more attention to the receivers than I do. Just kind of talk about how you think particularly maybe those two young guys have developed. And then, of course, you had Ontario Wilson with three catches. And then, of course, uh, Cam McDonald's been solid all year. In, in, my, in my opinion, Douglas came out of nowhere. Um, you know, I hadn't seen much that would indicate that he would have that kind of a performance against Miami or BC. Um, not to say that that he hasn't done anything at practice, but he hasn't been featured. So it was kind of uh, uh, surprising is the right word. The guys I've seen developing uh, would include Williamson. I think he's, we see him at practice. Uh, he's a long guy that makes plays like, like um, uh, Malik made on Saturday. But, you know, Malik is just a steady guy. You know, at practice, he's, uh, he has the confidence of an older guy. And um, I think he, he just is more mature. Um, and, and I think, uh, he, you know, his, his future is bright. I, I really believe that. Yeah, there are little, little subtleties, I think, on these Monday press conferences from the coaches. And, and, you know, Kenny Dillingham saying that was the first time he's seen a receiver go up and, and high point a ball quite like that in the two years since they've been there. And I think that's A, praise, but also B, come on, we need the rest of the guys to, to make some plays like that. So I, I think they're recognizing the, the, the potential, and that's a Dillingham word that he, uh, he doesn't like it when you, when you talk about potential, but we are seeing the, the capabilities, and now it's just, hey, you know, let's do this more consistently week to week. But you threw me a fastball, and I'm going to let it go right by. I'm not, I'm not getting on your potential train because I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. But uh, and we're positive vibes. We're five and six. We're, we're going to Florida. All right, so we've covered offense. We've covered defense. FSU was five and six on the year after starting 0 and four. One game away from going to the bowl, a bowl and Mark and I were talking about some of the bowl uh, speculation from today's articles. We won't get into that right now, but Jerry, you had told me after the Jacksonville state game that I would feel much better. Uh, you did say this about eight weeks ago that I feel much better about the season if they beat Miami and if they beat Florida. And when you said it, 
I didn't think there was any way that's possible. And now it's very possible that Florida State goes to Gainesville on Saturday with a head coaching <laughs> team and a team that not only can Florida State go to a bowl if it wins, it can also keep Florida out of a bowl. Did any of you guys see this coming out of Louisville game on September 25th when this team was 0-4? No. I don't know. I, was no, hoping, I mean I – we were looking at like three, four wins, hoping they'd get to four wins. I didn't see. I mean, after that, after that game, I, I, I was at a loss of where we're going to find a win. Honestly, the way we were playing, the things that we were going through, and it, you know, the, to be where we are, it's a credit to the coaching staff, to the process they've, you know, the culture they've built up to this point. It's uh, you got to give them a lot of credit, and the kids too. Obviously, the kids fought through it. The kids didn't listen to all the noise. They just kept their head down, kept working. And, uh, you know, little successes kept building, kept building on top of each other. And, and we, we are where we are now. That first half of football was the best half of football I've seen Florida State play in years. It really was. Boston and, College, I agree. It's the best yeah. half I can remember to playing in a while. That's, look, that's not a bad team, and it's got a, a very talented head coach. Yes, it does. Oh, so, I I mean, we talked about it last week when we were picking the game. I sat here and ripped off every uh, reason why, uh, you know, it's going to be a tough game. And then they finally said, well, but we'll win. You know, I mean, yeah. remember, I mean, it's just going in. I, I was hopeful, you know. Well, let's roll back to Louisville, Pat, to your question when we were, I guess, 0-4. Yeah. And did we see this? You know, well, no, none of us saw it. But the one thing we all saw was a team that would fight and not quit. You're exactly right. And that's sort of the thing, Mark, you guys as coaches talk about is, you know, it always gives you a chance to win if you have that mentality. And uh, I think this team, we knew it even in the uh, at 0-4. Yeah, and I was going to ask you what you credit this fairly remarkable comeback to, and that's kind of where I was going to go with it, but I was interested in getting your point. Uh, your take on that too, Bob. Just kind of talk. You've been out of practice, just like Jerry. Just talk about what I mean. What do you, other than the grit and toughness to fight and compete, no matter what the score says? What else do you credit this to, if anything, or is it simply as easy as that? Yeah, I think the coaches will say it's work and, and words like daily investment. That's kind of a Norvellism saying daily investment. I, I think something that that we have to keep in perspective, and I wrote a little bit about it Friday, is this team has a chance to be remembered fondly, not because of how it started. Oh, and four, that would have been a really negative way for us to remember it, but just because of how it's finished and how it's fought. And if you can win a state title and potentially that was, that was kind of mocked back in 2016. I think they had the rings and that was, that was mocked by a lot of people. You know, why did Jimbo or somebody decide to do that? Well, that's something to be proud of that you've won state titles, whether you do a ring or not. And I, I think how far this program has come from 0-4 is pretty, pretty remarkable. I think, I think it should be celebrated. And maybe years down the road with Norvell's program, we say, wow, you know, that 2021 team, they, they did something significant, even though there were so many deficiencies, so much talent that just wasn't quite there in a lot of position groups. But there was enough leadership. There was some good coaching and a lot of young kids who were fired up and ready to go out there. Yeah, and to your point, we the last four years we have watched a seven and six team, a five and seven, a six and seven, and a three and six. If you work your way up from twenty seventeen, and to your point, I don't remember the seven and six team. Obviously, had a winning record because they went to the bowl and won the Independence Bowl. But even that team, and it, from what I can remember, was not as much fun to watch as this particular team. Oh, no. uh, and we talked about the fact that what we wanted, you know, coming into the season, that what we wanted was a team that even if it didn't win every game that we could be proud of. And I believe that's what I think that's what Mike Norvell has kind of created is a, like you said, Jerry, a team that is going to fight. It's not going to give up. It has not given up in any game this year. Uh, it's always been completely dominated in one. I was I believe that's the Wake Forest game. Uh, pretty much everywhere else, they've at least been in the ball game, which says a lot about this team. Then I want to get your thoughts on – I want to get each of your thoughts on this. As we were walking through this, the teams that Florida State has lost to, a 9-2 and two Wake Forest team, 
an eight and three Clemson team, an uh, eight and three NC State team. Um, who am I missing here? Nine and one Notre Dame. Nine and one Notre Dame, and then you got uh, Louisville. Louisville. And then, of course, we're not going to talk about Jacksonville State, but Jacksonville State. We'll talk about them next. We'll talk about them next week, maybe, maybe. But listen, I mean, what? Did, what I mean, we did not think this team would compete against those type of teams, right? Uh, you know, we thought some of these games would be larger blowouts, and so just give me your thoughts on. You know, when we when we take a look at the totality of how close those games were and the, to most of the teams they've lost to, I mean, does anybody have any great takeaway from that, or has it made a big impression on anyone? I just think it shows you that before the season, when everybody sits there and evaluates a schedule, things change quickly, especially at this level. Injuries, whether t- I mean, you look at what's happened at University of Florida; they were in the game against Alabama, they lose a close game, and then all of a sudden, the team falls apart and they fire their coach. It just things change in college football. So looking at the schedule, it looked like the back end of the schedule would be the harder part and things have fallen in their favor and they've taken advantage of those uh, situations and won games that probably they shouldn't have won. But I I think that credit goes to the coaching staff in that they kept this team together. I've said the same thing. I know you guys hit me up the other day with the game. This team is what they are. They're they're not going to blow anybody out. Um, a lot, I, the blowouts too, a lot of times come from just fluke plays and uh, turnovers and block punts and a lot of stuff that you can't predict before a game. It, the team is what they are. They're a gritty team. They're not super talented. They, they've overachieved this year. The coaching staff's done a great job, and you hope they can continue that. But at the end of the day, this is all great. They have, one, they, they have to finish it off this week, or to me it's for not. They have to get – they got to win the six games now. If there's, it doesn't matter where the Gators were rated right before the season started. It is where they are right now. The game is right in front of them. They got to win it. They got to go six and six. They got to get to a bowl game, and that and that's how that the season has to end. Or a lot of this stuff, it, it was great, but what really at the end of the day, what's a five and seven season? Well, I'll say this. I will say this. If they lose against Florida, and I will get into this a little bit in a few minutes because that's where we're going with this conversation, I think we've seen such strides in the program that I would still leave with a positive feeling and coming out of the season and have me excited for spring practice and for the next fall. Now there's some huge, going to be some huge shoes to fill. There are going to be a lot of questions, just like there are every year going into next season. But – from where we were, and we talked about we talk about this all the time. Uh, from you know, we get the chance to change our narrative of what we think about this team every week because that every week is a season or it's a chapter in a large long book. Um, I think that this was uh, a lot more uh, happy ending to a book, the book that started zero and four. I think what I think that the strides they have made since October have been substantial. Uh, and I wasn't sure I was going to be able to say that on September 25th coming with that Louisville game. But um, – that's, I mean, that's why you got to give – you got to give the coaching staff so much credit. I mean, sitting 0-4, you're, te- you're, you're teetering on losing the team. You know, if you come down too hard and you just – you're just – you know, you're on them and, and it, it's it's a – it's a real negative kind of kind of deal, you know. Kids will just like, well, what, what am I going through this for, you know? But to, 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 you know, you talk about group psychology to get to get that kind of response from the team week after week is a tricky deal. And to go zero and four and have some of the tough things that have happened up to this point, up to that point, and to come out the other end the way they and every week fight like they do, you can't overstate how impactful the culture that started with Norvell. You know, these kind of things are built in the offseason. Yeah. That attitude's built in the offseason. But, yeah. Mark, there's guys in that locker room that you got to give credit to. Number 11 was part of a winning program. He's brought that into that locker room. Number four, had, had even though South Carolina wasn't great, he was part of a program that did have success, especially on their side. Like, they brought in some pieces – that have really solidified that locker room and helped that team not fold when things got tough. Because yeah. if they don't have number 11, we're not talking about of course all not. these wins. Of course not. Of course I, not. You, he is the most important player on that team. Yeah, and and but you got to remember, I mean, Fish, we're all in agreement here on this, is Norvell did a great job of evaluating and getting the right transfers, right. including 11. 
Keir Thomas has been a really positive factor. Love but, Jerry, Taylor. but Jerry, how much? Yes. I mean, listen, they, they brought in 20 guys, five or six have made it. Well, it's also, no, a, no, it's also a numbers thing. They brought in sure. a lot and they had to get lucky too a little bit. I mean, listen, I, I, I give them credit for that. There's no question, but yeah, but there's some guy it's, they've, they've made mistakes too in the evaluations on a lot of kids too. They, they just, they hit on that kid. And that they rolled the dice on a kid that was a backup of, at Georgia. And they had, how, how many times are you going to get a top 15, 20 pick out of the transfer portal? I, I just think a little it, 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 it's, it all goes together. It all it, goes it, together. It, it all goes together. It, it's, and, that, and that's my but, whole thing is for next year, like who replaces those two guys? Everybody well, can sit there and say, oh, well, listen, if they don't land Marvin Jones Jr. or one of those type of guys, then they got to. But every gotta, year, but every year somebody emerges. You, uh, you know, every year somebody emerges. You, I hope so. Well, we're listen, we're, and they're going to have to hit the portal again. That portal is going to have to be a part of the success next year. They're going to they're going to have to repeat some of that. There's no doubt. Uh, yeah. I don't think it's all going to be done with bringing in a bunch of freshmen. And they got 32 scholarships this year to give. So, uh, you know, I, yeah, yeah, I think I think they've got to go out and get. I think they got to jump right back in and get two more defensive ends, just like they did this year. I think they've got to go out and get two more offensive linemen at least, uh, you know, because their numbers are down there to begin with, uh, just from a sure scholarship standpoint. But yeah, listen, they're, they've definitely got some things to work on for the future. But for the most part, uh, the guys that they brought in did hit big time, particularly on defense, not so much on offense, but certainly on defense. We didn't get the star breakout from any of the offensive transfers that I can think of. But, uh, yeah, so, listen, one other thing before we move into the Florida game, uh, you know, I think we got to give them credit. Uh, Adam Fuller's been under fire, fire all year long, uh, going back particularly to the first month of the season and particularly that second game of the season. But, listen, uh, he got to break the rock on Saturday uh, after the BC game, which was one of the most prestigious honors Norvell gives to any member of the – organization I was breaking the victory rock and uh guys just give me a little bit of mark listen you've been in that guy's shoes uh I was uh you know you you not necessarily as a the target but you know not, not the main target but obviously you've been with a staff where teams are struggling uh just talk about uh what kind of vindication that had to be for him as this season's moved along and uh, be you know listen that's that's a big deal in the locker room right I mean those kind of traditional things yeah, and from what I heard, that the players asked Coach Norville for him to break the rock. And as a coach, I can't, ima- you know, I can't imagine how humbling that is because, look, every coach knows good players make great coaches, <laughs> you know, and, and, and that's, that's, a, that's a tenuous position to be in, you know. Um, look, they have improved. Players have emerged. Players have gotten better. The schemes um, – are, are on point in terms of, you know, what they're trying to take away and the things they're doing. The kids have a better understanding of what's happening. Um, so, yeah, he, he gets a lot of credit of taking the pieces that he has and putting them in the right place and, and maximizing their, their skills. And that's the definition of being a coach. And he's doing his job. And that's, and that's good to see that, he, you know, when given the pieces, he can, he can get it done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Bob, Mark, Fish, Jerry, anything, anything on Adam? I think the guy's taken a beating for two years from fans, from just about everybody, the media. And honestly, I, I feel like the defense is, is the most improved part of the team uh, this year. I, it's the offense that gets me upset because the lack of consistency of playing great for one half but not the whole game. I think Fuller has taken a beating from everybody. I think the defense has done what they needed to do. And honestly, if it wasn't for those guys – I don't think they're sitting at five and six right now. I think the defense has kept them in the season. And we've talked about this before for Florida state to have success. Their defense sets the tone at that school and that program. When the defense does well, it really helps out the offense. It gets the ball back turnovers, the momentum of game switch, you know, even, even in the BC game, they just had to make one play on that final drive. And they did, they made it and and they've won those games. And, and I got, I give Fuller all the credit. I think he deserves, deserves to break the rock in the locker room. 
Well, he did, and uh, I thought it was a very cool thing for uh, the kids to do, and uh, we had not seen that since Mike's been here, uh, Coach Breaking the Rock, I don't believe. I think it's always been a player. So that was kind of fun to see, and they have, they have improved. And uh, we can talk a little bit about the offense in the offseason, but I do think that the reason they cannot sustain consistency is because they do not have the playmakers at receiver to make this offense vi- uh, balanced as it needs to be. And I still think the offensive line is, uh, you know, once they f- get a beat on what you're going to do, even in the run game, they start to shut that down in the second half, as we saw against BC. So, uh, but yeah, listen, uh, I think that, that, you know, there's just not a lot of help there this year. And uh, like they've, like you said, finished several weeks ago, maybe even a month into the season, the offensive coaches are going to have to manufacture uh, plays and wins. And what we saw, Mark, as you saw, when y'all talked about all the uh, game planning, especially early in the first quarter when they were doing all the motion and trying to create mess matches and get a beat on what Boston College was doing. They had a great game plan to start the game, and it, it carried them through. All right, so listen, uh, obviously a huge game uh, this year or this week against Florida. We have not played them in two years. Uh, not unlike – their trip to Miami last year, one of the teams will not have its head coach on the sideline, and that happens to be Dan Mullen from Florida, who was let go uh, on Sunday after a loss to Missouri. So Florida State has Florida right where they want them. Florida State is a minus two-and-a-half point favorite to open the week. They have not lost any game the last three weeks where they have been a minus two-and-a-half point favorite when the game opened. All right, so Dan Mullen is known as one of the better play callers uh, in college football. That's his reputation. Uh, Florida State goes in there. Uh, they were out there. They're now without their head coach, their offensive line coach, and their defensive coordinator. Uh, what are you guys expecting going to Gainesville on Saturday? Who's going first? I guess it's all you fish. You know, I, who knows what you expect from Florida? I thought. You know, one, I didn't think they should have fired their coach. I just think it's ridiculous. I, I, I don't know. I have a lot more respect for Mullen as a coach. I think, you know, just like um, the coach at Notre Dame a couple years ago had a losing season, I thought he deserved the opportunity to fix his coaching staff. He won 11 games one year, 10 the other, took him to the SEC title game last year. I, don't, I just don't know what the expectations of that fan base is. It's when the two teams ahead of them are just a lot better right now. Um, going well, no, I'm this, talking about what are you expecting from Florida State going into the I mean, Florida game? I, don't, I mean, I, I expect. I think. I, expect, the, I think the Mullen thing. There were layers. It was more than just yeah. wins and losses. This yeah, year. I mean, I expect the same thing from Florida State. Their defense to come to play. I think the offense will have its moments where um, they'll be good. But this, I, I just, you know, they're going to have to score. This is going to be a game. I think it's going to be a higher scoring game in the 30s, and um, you know, Florida State's going to have to have one or two stops. I'm going to. I don't want to screw it up. I mean, I keep picking against them, so and they keep winning. So I think it's better that I just stay on that side of the tracks, and I don't want to kill them. It's a real. It's a you real. And, interesting you and Vegas it's, both. You yeah. and Vegas both. I, I'll just. It's I, hey, listen. You don't want to jinx the team on my on my picking. It's the only ones I'm not getting right every week. But it's it's gonna be real. It's gonna be if, really, if only if only we had that kind of energy that translated that far, we would be very successful in other things. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, – yeah. So, uh, Bob, what are, you th- what are your thoughts going to Florida? I think Florida's biggest advantage is just the element of surprise. From a play-calling standpoint, you just – all that preparation is of personnel. And I think some of the coaches referenced that on Monday on the Florida State side. You can look at personnel and, and understand the players that Florida's going to put out there, but you just don't have a great feel for – play calling and maybe how they'll substitute different packages um, on the Florida state side. I think it's, it's pretty much the same formula. It is run the ball. It's used Jordan Travis's legs on defense. It's a different kind of pass rush. It, it's not a, it's not an all out because you got a pocket quarterback like Jerkovich. You've got to kind of be more disciplined and responsible because um, these runs from the Florida quarterbacks are designed, um, but plays are going to break down and they're going to, they're going to be scrambling too. So it's, it's a different formula, but I think it's, again, Florida's biggest thing going for them is just the unexpected. What you don't know after countless long days of planning and preparation and practice, you're going to see stuff on Saturday that the, the four state coaches just say, we didn't think about that, or we, we just didn't see it. 
Oh, I think they're going to empty the cabinet on offense and defense, Florida, uh, because they got nothing to lose, right? They're down three coaches. Uh, you're down your offensive line coach. You're down your defensive coordinator. And you're down your head coach, who's your offensive coordinator, really. Mark, what do you expect to see on Saturday? Yeah, so that's the interesting thing about it, right, is you've got a coaching staff in transition that we're playing against. Now, are those guys scrambling looking for jobs? You know, are some details going to be missed in preparation? You know, I mean, you, uh, look, <laughs> you got a lame duck coaching staff over there whose livelihood is changing. Their families are impacted and they're looking around going, OK, oh, by the way, we got a game to play. So that's that's a whole different vibe, you know, preparing for a game during the week. And do, so will some things fall through the cracks? That's just going to be interesting to see after we see the result. Right. Going in for Florida State. Look, um, we're susceptible to when the plays break down with a, with a mobile quarterback. If it, we have to contain that, I think I think we'll cover good enough, and we'll 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 we'll, we'll kind of stop what they're wanting to do. And then when those things break down, can we respond and, and chase that guy down and limit his ability to to ad lib and make plays? That's going to be a key on defense. Offensively, they got athletes on defense. They're big up front. They can run. You know, are are we going to be able to 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 generate a running game um, somehow, some way? And, and Jordan's obviously going to be, be a big part of that, but they've got to be able to respect him throwing the ball, which, you know, the last two, three weeks, two weeks for sure, he's demonstrated the ability to do that. So going in, again, more of the same. But look, it's, it, they're, 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 the level of competition we're playing this week is a lot better than the last two weeks, you know, even regardless of what's going on around him. And that's the X factor. If we can get, up, get on top of him early, and get the crowd mumbling and, and have, show some doubt in their eyes, I think they might fold. Hey, Mark, I want to go back to the point you made about the assistant coaches looking for jobs. Do you think that that may be even more magnified because some of these assistant positions are probably going to be filled at these openings or the places where there are openings right after this week? I mean, you got to think that there'll probably be a couple of these head coaching hires that will be made within – 24 to 24 hours to a week as this regular season ended. Do you think that has takes a focus away from the? I think there's no question. I mean, look, those guys got to be working the phones. They got to get themselves in position, right? And yep. and that takes time. That takes time away from preparation. That takes their attention away from what they're actually trying to do. Look, you need you need total focus during these game week preparations. You need you need to com- be committed. And if you got this other thing going on on the side here, and not to mention the anxiety that 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 it brings to you personally and to you and your family, um, that's that's a deal now. I mean, that's it's going to be interesting to see how that manifests itself during the course of the ball game. Now, I'm assuming we all agree that the turmoil in Gainesville is an advantage to Florida State, right? Is there anybody that doesn't think that? Oh, it definitely is. Yep. All right, now let me ask you this, <laughs> because it is another way to look at it. Because of what's going on in Gainesville, does this put the pressure on Florida State when you factor in they got, they're got they the team with the head coach, they're the team with the staff intact, and they're the team, obviously, that's just like Florida trying to fight to go to a bowl game. Does the pressure now, because of that, if Dan Mullen had been there in good standing, it's almost like Florida State's playing with house money. Now it's almost like Florida's playing with the house money and FSU's got the pressure. I think if you're Florida State, you want to start fast. And you want to just come out there and, and quiet the crowd as much as possible and, and really just, just do what you want to do on the field. Run, get after the quarterback. I, I think if, if you do something similar to what they've done the last couple of weeks, I think this looks like a formula and a game plan for a win. But then you, you have to expect that that challenge back, which is what Miami and, and BC have done the last two weeks too. You have to you have to withstand those punches. Well, I think they got to jump on Florida quickly and and make them not want to be there because I think if Florida State could get a lead like they do in the Boston College game, it could get out of control. Um, I, I think I do think as talented as Florida is, I, I think this team needs a reason to quit, and Florida State's got to take you know take care of that right away in this game. So this is, this is their chance to turn around a crappy season. They're looking at it the same way we are. Yeah. Right? I mean, they, 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 
they're in turmoil. This is a chance to kind of grab a little bit of pride back in their program. And so they're going to come out. Uh, look, we're going to get their best shot. Make no doubt about it. It's not going to be easy by any stretch. So I, I know we're going in real confident. And I see a lot more stuff on social media from Seminole fans talking, you know, that we're, you know, we're feeling pretty confident Seminole Nation is. Um, I'm sure Norvell is is checking that with the players and, and making sure that they're doing what they need to do. Thank goodness. But um, this is not going to be easy. Yeah, I would, I would, I'll chime in on that. I mean, yeah, this is a game between players who know each other, you know, and the players on Florida are going to come out and want to play good. And Florida State players will bring some emotion to that game. To me, the key is the same as the key was two weeks ago against Miami. Can you control your emotion? And can you execute the game plan that's been put in front of you? If I was Norville, I, I would uh, I would approach this game as as the bowl game because uh, we're not going to get to play an opponent as good as this one. We won't play in an atmosphere as exciting as this will be on Saturday. You know, Bill McGrath wrote it back in the '60s that um, you know the Florida game is the game all capital letters, V. And I, I, would, I would stay focused on that, that, you know, we don't know what Florida's going to do, but we got a pretty damn good idea. Because if they start changing a bunch of stuff, they'll execute nothing. So the, those coaches down there, they may be distracted, as Mark said, and I agree with Mark on that. But they've got five days to prepare college kids, 20 hours they've got for Florida State. And so they're going to have to stay 85, 90, 95 percent of their game plan is going to have to be stuff that they can execute. Oh, yeah, definitely. But I think you're going to see some, uh, on, uh, you know, I think you're going to see some trick, trick, trick trickery, uh, oh, yeah. go after a block punt, fake sure. a pop, those kind of things. Yeah. Whatever they got in their bag of tricks yeah. that they've used somewhere during the year, they'll, they'll bring out. But um, usually you don't win games on that. You win games on, on uh, you know, playing a sound, solid uh, ball game, executing. And we can't go down there. I hope we have SEC officials. We do not. <laughs> yeah, I hope you're right. I, hope I mean, we can't have 13 penalties and – Right. miss some of the opportunities that we had against Boston College uh, and expect to, to, to win that game. The, the good news is it feels like we're peaking. You know, it, yes. feels, like, it feels like we're, we're on an upswing. We're, you know, we're executing better. Quarterback's playing well. Defense is playing well. You know, we got to keep that going, and we got to play our best game. Yes, we do. And, I, you know, we played pretty good against Miami, and uh, I, think, I think the focus will be there. Um, for Florida State. Now, how they get Florida kids focused, I'm not sure. Mark, I mean, is, that would probably be a challenge, wouldn't it? it? Absolutely it is. There's a lot of noise. That's what I'm saying. There's, there's a lot of distractions. There's a lot going on. The coaches are distracted. You know, there's – but you know what? Here's the deal. You're 11 games in. You are who you are. To your point, they're not going to change a lot of stuff. They can't, you know, and – so you're going to get pretty much, you know, what you're pretty much what you're going to get. Now the question is, you know, uh, what's 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 going to fall through the cracks because of all the stuff going on around them. That's going to be the key. Yep. Oh. yep. Well, Jerry, uh, I don't think there's anything quite like the Florida Florida State matchup, even if we went to a bowl. But just so you know, one of the bowl projections I read today has Florida State going to Jacksonville to play Arkansas. It's a, it's a pretty good team. So we'll see. We'll see how that works out. I think yeah. that was that. That's a crazy pick for a bowl uh, game. But anyway, let's. let's but hey, you know, I'm, a, I'm going to Shreveport. You guys promised me a trip. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what. Well, though, you don't answer know. that, Jerry. I don't so know. Let's, any, let's talk. Any. All right. So we have a – y'all did predictions on Florida State last week. I have not been joining in, and we all know the reason for that. Uh, but I am going to do it this week. So let's go through our kick. We're going to go through rivalry week picks. We're, we're going to start. We'll say we'll say Florida State, Florida for last. All right. So let's just let's start in state. You got U, USF at UCF. I, I think we're all going UCF, right? 
Unless yes. UPS bus goes off a cliff, yes. There's no cliffs in Florida. <laughs> exactly. So they happen. So you're pretty There's good. Sinkholes, though. There are sinkholes. <laughs> that is true in they a lot need, in that central they, Florida area, too. They need, yes, there are. They need sinkholes, USF, man. Well, they, they might they might appreciate a good sinkhole right now. <laughs> All right, let's go back to the ACC for a second. We got North Carolina at NC State. Mark, who you got? I got North Carolina. Ooh. I, I, yes, I, I think I think, and I'll say this about uh, some other teams too. I think NC State peaked. I think they're done. I think uh, I think North Carolina is is, is going to win. Now this North Carolina's whole season. I'm going with the Tar Heels. Wow, look at this. Bob? Games in Raleigh. I think NC State finishes it off. Yep. Jerry? Yeah, Raleigh. And defense wins. I'm going pack. Whatever that little thing is they do. I got the pack. Yep. All right. I, I won a, a game that's big on the national stage. Ohio State at Michigan. A lot of college football playoff on the line. Uh, Fish, we'll go with you. We'll start with you. Ohio State or Michigan? It's hard for me to go against Ohio State, but I think Jim Harbaugh finally gets over the uh, monkey off their back. I'm going to take the Michigan Wolverines. Boy, you're not going to have a good record this week. It's Bob? Hard. Ohio State. Jerry? Ohio State. I'm not betting on these games. I'll bet on some no, no, I'm just saying you're not going to have a very good record, uh, just out of pure pride. i got to let you guys come back. Yeah, I don't know. Whatever. I, think no, uh, I think I'm the only one that picked Clemson last week there, by the way, dude. <laughs> I wasn't there. You and your you you and your demon deacons. But I would I would have picked Wake anyway. So do you have Ohio State or Michigan, Mark? Oh, I got Ohio State. How could you pick against them after that performance? Yeah, I got Ohio State, State too. They're going to dismantle Michigan. All right, uh, a game that worries me a little bit: uh, Alabama versus Auburn. Auburn's not good. Where's yeah. it? There's no Bo Nix at, at Auburn. Yeah, yeah. Nix ain't playing either. Uh, I like Alabama. This is an easy decision, Bama. Bama. Yeah, there's too much at stake. I, I, oh, said, no, no, I don't think Auburn's not ready yet. All right. In the wacky coastal division of the ACC, we get Virginia Tech at UVA. Uh, I'm going Virginia. Yeah, I'll go with you, Pat. Yeah, UVA. Virginia, UVA. It's not even going to be close. The Hoos. You got the Cavs or the Hokies, Mark? The Hoos. The who's and you said uh, Virginia Tech, Bob. I, I said Virginia. All right, this is where I want to get a little wacky. Clemson at South Carolina. I'm going with South Carolina. Uh-huh. Ooh. I'm jumping on the chain train. Clem Tech. Good. I'm going Clem Tech. I, I just think their defense is too good. I don't think South Carolina. I, South Carolina's going to struggle to score. Yeah, Clemson. Clemson. All right, and another SEC ACC matchup: Kentucky at Louisville. Kentucky. 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 Yeah, Kentucky. I'm going to have to agree with you. Although if Mark Stoops is being shopped around like I hear he is, maybe Lowell sneaks up and gets some more. All right, for the big game of the weekend, Florida State at Florida, five and six, playing for your 13th game. Florida State seems to be rolling. It seems like two – like it seems like Florida State is – Booking north as fast as it can away from the Bermuda Triangle of football. And it seems like Florida has got it thr- thr- uh, throttled down, headed straight to the Bermuda Triangle of college football. Who's winning on Saturday in Gainesville? Jerry, we'll let you start. FSU, if our players don't get as overconfident as our fans are. All right. Uh, that's a fair enough assessment. Uh, Fish, you go ahead. I got to keep doing it so we can keep winning. I'll take the Please. I'll All take right. The oh, boy. Team. Thank you. The team player there. Mom, I'm falling on the sword for you guys, man. Come on. Yeah. Your reputation is going to be beaten this week. Florida uh, State's going to run the dead gum football and send fish to Shreveport. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mark, you? Yeah, yeah. you know, it's, it's in Gainesville. That, that's, that's a whole other – that's a whole nother thing we got to overcome. You know, um, their roster is pretty, still pretty deep. They got a lot of good players um, at Florida State. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll make my one and only FSU pick of the season. And I don't think it's going to be the last game of the season. I said that I was, I thought last week, uh, 
told somebody two weeks ago, right after the Miami game, that I thought if Florida State beat Boston College, it would go on to beat Florida. I think that they got momentum. I think it's going to happen. I, we did, you know, I think the Mullen thing is going to be a big deal because he is their play caller. I think there's a lot of advantages to Florida State uh, on their side now that weren't there two weeks ago. Uh, so I'm going Florida State, and I'm going. Uh, well, first of all, I have to because I predicted six and six as their record for the year. So now my math. I, I predicted six and six, but not this way. I well, nobody that. did. There is nobody that picked, like, you could have picked. You could have won the lotto if you would have picked these five, maybe six wins. <laughs> okay, so let's. All right, so let's just hypothesize just for a second that next Saturday at four o'clock, we're all having a celebratory drink of our favorite beverage. Uh, and we're celebrating a six and six year. We know it's going to be a mid-level bowl if they go bowling. What mid-level bowl outside of the matchup and just from the city would you want to go to? And I could, I, I could pull up the bowl for the ACC, but obviously we know what most of them are. You got the – the Belk in Charlotte. You've got the Gasparilla. You've got the Gator. You've got the Pinstripe. Um, Bob, any place you would want to travel in mid to late December? I think Florida State fans, especially in Jacksonville, would say that they've missed out on some of these games. I mean, I mean the the Boise game was messed up because of a hurricane and sent back this way. Yeah, I think Jacksonville would love to have Florida State, especially if those bowl tie-ins could be uh, could be arranged. So Florida State versus an SEC sounds like uh, sounds like a good matchup to me. Plus, they'd make up for the Boise State game they lost two years ago. Yep. Jerry, if you were going to travel to go see a bowl and it's two to four weeks. Are you all ready for this? I am ready for it. Pinstripe Bowl, because I've made plans to visit with my wife's family in New York. So that would be ideal. Pinstripe. All right. Fish? Just any team they could beat. <laughs> like, who are some of those, like, uh, Sun Belt and Conference USA teams? Well, there's none of those on the ACC bowl list. But that's oh, all uh, SEC, AAC, oh, man. Big Ten. Um, I'm, I'm going to San Diego. I'm going to go to the Holiday Bowl. Oh, that'd, be, that'd be nice to go out Holiday there. Bowl. I'm going to dream. Uh, uh, Music City Bowl. Come to Nashville. Right. But anyway. Let's go to San Diego. I like that. Mark, you're going to be severely disappointed. I don't think the Music City Bowl is on the uh, – It's not. On the no. docket anymore. Unless unless there's not enough Big Ten teams. All right. Not, Nashville doesn't have a bowl game anymore? I thought they No, no they do. We have, it's, it's, but it's the SEC versus a Big Ten school. All right. All know. right. Hey, now I'm going to end up with some more just general football questions. Um, as I told you guys, as we all know now, Florida, LSU, Southern Cal, Virginia Tech, TCU, Washington, and Washington State are all Power Five programs that are looking for head coaches. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that Lane Kiffin's going to almost every one of these particular schools. So I'm going to ask you, Fish, does Lane Kiffin end up at Florida, LSU, USC, Virginia Tech, Tennessee, or TCU, or Washington? I'm going to say he stays at Ole Miss and gets a big freaking fat raise. Okay. Jerry, any thoughts on Lane Kiffin and where he might end up next year? Uh, I think that – I don't know. I would think that uh, Ole Miss is going to try to pony up and keep him there. All right. Sully? Yeah, no. I, you know, he, he did the one-year thing in Tennessee and jumped to USC, and he got lambasted for it. I don't think he has – well, I don't think he probably cares, but – um, I think uh, isn't Jimmy Sexton his uh yep. his rep? Yeah, no, nah, he's gonna get a big fat raise. I'm with Fish. Troy That's State right. just opened up. Uh, who did? Troy State just fired their coach today. So. Chip Lindsey. It's Troy now. It's not just not Troy State. They're uh, Troy University. I think Lane sits on the Alabama job. I think he probably stays put and just waits for that opening and then sees if he's in the right position to get it. All right. Well, you know, I heard Bob Stoops is house shopping in Gainesville. Any, any chance Bob Stoops ends up in Gainesville? No, I think it's I think it's Gruden. 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 <laughs> I, I, can, I can see Mark Stoops. I don't see Bob Stoops. Man, we already went down that road. All right. Well. All right. Who is all right? So if you if you took Lane Kiffin, Billy Napier, uh, Mario Cristobal, 
uh, Jeff Halfley, Lincoln Riley, Mark Stoops, Hugh Freeze, and James Franklin, which one of those guys is best suited for Florida? Is that too many choices? You left out P.J. Flug. Yeah, that's my boy. <laughs> They're not going to let P.J. come foot row your boat. You can't row a boat in the swamp. Everybody knows that. You, 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 can, you can row a canoe down there, though, man. I think the question to the question to fish might be who has the best recruiting ties within I, the state I, of Florida. I think James Franklin would be the perfect fit just because of Jay Wan Sider being on that staff, he could come back. And Franklin's a hell of a recruiter. They 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 want a recruiter first. I think Franklin's a good enough coach that with the talent they have, he'd be fine there. Fair enough. That, hey, would, um, that would be that would be a great get for them. That would be a great get. get. That would yeah. be a great get. That yeah, would be I, a I, good I hear a lot of be fired up about. Yeah, I hear a lot of Napier, you know, I hear a lot of, you know, Stoops, I don't think would excite them. So, I don't, you know, I, he would give you a solid hire, but I don't know that he'd excite the, excite the masses. All right, well, let's, all right, let's do this then. Is Luke Fickle at Cincinnati at the end of this, after this year? Luke Fickle no, at Cincinnati. No, he's gone. Well, let me rephrase your especially, question. Especially, especially if they don't make the playoff. That's but I, that was how I was yeah. going to rephrase it. Suppose Cincinnati makes the playoff. Is Luke I, Fickle at, I, I at think, Cincinnati? I think it all depends. That if, job, if he, like I, it all dep- I, I think he's a Big Ten coach. I don't think he's going to take one of these Southern jobs. I agree. If Franklin leaves, then he gets the Penn State job. If Jim Harbaugh decides he's had enough at Michigan, wants to go to the NFL, he'll get that job. Like. He needs one of those jobs to open up in the Big Ten, I believe. I don't think Fickle's the right fit. Yeah. I've I, I've had lunch with the guy. I've sat or, I've met the guy a bunch of times. He is just not a – like, P.J. would fit a lot better in the South than he would. I just don't think he would do well with the, the people in the South. He's a Michigan, Ohio State, Big Ten coach. That's just my belief. But you know, if Cincinnati if Cincinnati makes the playoff, it's because something crazy happened this last week, right? And and that's the only way they're gonna make well, it. Well, Alabama loses twice. I think Cincinnati is in the playoffs. I, I, I just I think that it's gonna happen. if Alabama loses to Georgia. That would be that would be crazy. <laughs> and then, why? Why? I mean, Georgia's the best team in the country. Yeah. yeah. So hey, the way I look at that is Alabama's playing Georgia this week in the next, in the, next, next yeah, in the in the championship game. I mean that is a playoff game. If you win it, you're in. If you if you get beat by Georgia, you're out. I mean, you got your shot at Georgia and you didn't win. You you don't think Notre Dame nine and one Notre Dame or well Notre Dame lost to Cincinnati, so it'd be hard for them to sit there and put them no, in. That's true. Yeah. All right. That's so true. one of the chances Georgia loses Alabama that there's not two SEC teams in the they'll, de- they'll definitely be two, but at that point, but I just I, I have. I mean, I don't know. I've watched Alabama play this year, and I, I have a ton of faith in Nick Saban. That Georgia team, they have one of those defenses I haven't seen in a very long time. I, I just think that team's close to unbeatable this year. So we'll see what happens. But my money's on them taking it all. And it, it isn't going to – the SEC championship's going to be uh, – Yeah, but there is uh, the pucker factor. And, <laughs> Hey, everybody gets over that pucker factor sooner or later, you know? Is there any way that two Big Ten teams in the, in the college football playoff? No, just one. Okay. Even though the Pac 12's out. Yep. They're you, have a, you, you still have a shot at a Big 12 team. If Oklahoma State wins this weekend, I think they'd have a shot, but a lot of stuff would have to fall. Now, I watched Oklahoma State this weekend. Of all the teams, they have one of the better defenses I've watched, which is shocking for a Big 12 team. But they actually have some dudes on that defense, and they got a team that runs the ball very well. He, I think he's a hell of a coach. I, I'm still shocked that a school like Florida or one of these schools hasn't made a run at Mike Gundy. Yeah, I just think he's happy. I mean, the place seems to suit him. But I, I said the same thing to somebody last night. I'm totally shocked that nobody's made a run, a big enough run that he's actually. I mean, what he has done there is quite remarkable. It's, it's uh, a remarkable. And they might be this. They might be the most quiet nine and one season anybody in college football's had. Go no watch one them play. They're, good, they're, good. they're a good football team. So, but I'm telling you what, there's this. This next two weeks is going to be interesting as it comes to the playoff. I mean, there could be some really funky things happening because nobody in the ACC is going. Nobody in the Pac-12 is going. So it's come down to Cincinnati, 
Alabama, Ohio State, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, Ohio State, and Michigan. I mean, it's going to and, – and now that could get sideways if Michigan were to beat Ohio State. Then Michigan – yeah, listen, it's, it's going to be some interesting scenarios by the time we get to uh, whatever the – Day as they announce everything, but it's, it's been a crazy season, it's been a fun season. Uh, but anyway, hey, well, guys, that's really all I had. Uh, Bob and Jerry, y'all were at the press conference today for Mike Norvell, uh, Kenny Dillingham, and Adam Fuller. Any takeaways from that, uh, from the uh, press conference today before we close out? I, I was, I was not there, passion. yeah. I think Norvell's passion, you know. I think coaches like to talk about the faceless opponent. Somebody asked the question of Norvell and a lot of times coaches fall into that, you know, the opponent, it, it's not a, a factor. It's about us and what we do. I think Norvell embraces the rivalry and the opponent. I think he talks a lot about you know, Miami. He didn't use the word Florida um, all that much, if at all today. So it was clear he was trying to avoid um, in a kind of, kind of in an awkward way, not referencing Florida but I think there's a lot of wanting to finish, you know, coaches saying players want to finish and get one more game. They don't call it a bowl. They say, get one more, get one more game. So it's just kind of an interesting how the coaches I think are in lockstep in what they're saying and how they're saying it. And it, it feels like very much a kind of a, a united agreement of what they're trying to do, which is beat Florida and get to a bowl. So. Yep. I agree. Uh, listen, I think it's going to be a uh, very interesting game on Saturday. I cannot wait for it. I have not been this excited for FSU Florida game probably in about five seasons. I would imagine that all you guys are about the same way. I know, Bob, for you and I, who were down two years ago, uh, it was almost – you almost dreaded the trip, right? I mean, I remember thinking, oh, God, i got to sit through this game. <laughs> That's essentially what we did. Uh, but, yeah, so I'm looking forward to it. Uh Obviously, a lot we can continue to talk about, but we've run over our uh, schedule time that we try to uh, keep our listeners to. And uh, I want to thank everybody for joining me, Bob, Jerry, Mark, Fish. Uh, join, uh, join it as always. If you're an Osceola subscriber, thank you for listening. If you're a Seminole Sidelines podcast listener, we would ask you to please give us a try. Uh, the Osceola, a try. Go to theosceola.com. Go to the subscription tab, then go to the discount code field and enter FSU20, FSU20 for 20% off our annual discount rate of $74.95. And obviously, we got basketball going on, fall baseball, uh, soccer. Uh, it's really busy time at Florida State. And if you'd like to give us a try, we also have a monthly rate of six. 95 uh, but we look forward to talking to you guys next week after the Florida game uh, hopefully we'll be talking about an additional football game for Florida State this year uh, but thanks to our listeners for tuning in and we'll be back next week and Mark Salvo will you please sign us off as normal gig the Gators baby this has been another edition of the Osceola's Seminole Sidelines to subscribe to the Osceola go to theosceola.com go Noles.